with what is OTT anyway? Well, OTT literally stands for over the top, which doesn't really tell you very much of what it actually is. So um, to, to clarify that, it's uh, anything that is not delivered through traditional cable or receivers, so non-traditional television, basically. To put it simply, it means video over the internet. Now, I'm going to be using the word media throughout this presentation instead of video, because it can also be audio, or it could also be metadata, or other data similar to that. Ah. And uh, to add to that, uh, internet protocol set top boxes, uh, HPV TV, and similar solutions are all also technically examples of OTT, even though they are associated with traditional cable providers and may use a traditional cable receiver to be provided. So we'll just generalize it right now to OTT will be internet-based delivery. All right, some of the important topics in uh, talking about this is codex containers and transport. I'll quickly explain what all of them are, and then I'll go deeper into all of them which will basically be the entire presentation. Uh, a codec is a way to encode uh, video or audio data, a way to make it take less space, basically, for sending over the internet. Because raw data, that's just not doable. Um, containers are uh, methods to store that encoded data and uh, put it into something that can be sent over the internet. And the transport is then the method that you send it over the internet with. So to start with codecs, codecs are, as I said, the method to encode data for storage or transport. And there are several popular ones. There's hundreds of codecs, obviously, but I'll list some of the popular ones off. For video, we have H.264 AVC, which is the current most popular choice. Then there's H.265, better known as HEVC, which is kind of the, the, the up and coming one that m many people are already switching to. And there's VP8 and 9, which is the one that Google has been working on which is kind of a competitor to ATVC. And all of them basically do the same thing, which is make video smaller. And they have quality differences, bitrate differences. It's th there's a lot of differences that I will dive into further in the next slide. Now, for audio, we have a uh, similar codex. There's uh, AAC, which is, again, the current most popular choice. Opus is something that I personally think is uh, the, the, the holy grail of audio, basically. It's an audio codec that can do literally anything. MP3 is kind of on the way out, but everyone knows it, so I felt obligated to list it here. That's why it's between parentheses. And there's, of course, the popular choices for surround sound, like Dolby and DTS, which are not used over the internet often because most computers are not connected to a surround sound installation. Um, for subtitles, we have something similar. We have uh, subrip, which is what's used on DVDs usually. Well, not directly, but it's ripped from DVDs. And WebVTT is more or less the Apple equivalent of this. Well, it's used by Apple, not made by them. And there's literally hundreds of other subtitle standards, so I can't even list them all if I wanted to. So moving on to, uh, ah, right. And there's upcoming video codecs. Um, AV1 is something that's being made by the Open Media Alliance, which is basically a mixture of VP10, which was a codec, or is a codec in development, DALA, which is another codec in development, and Thor, again, a codec in development. And they've kind of merged these together into what should be the holy grail of the video codec, so similar to what Opus is for audio, this should be that for video in the future. And since after this merger, it's a bit unclear how fast exactly development is going, I would expect this to be available sometime 2017-19-ish. Uh, it could be earlier than that. It could be later than that. There's really no way to know for sure. But I think that's a pretty good estimate. So how do you pick a codec? Well, I think the main reason to pick a particular codec is convenience, because you may already have media encoded in that codec, or it might be really easy to switch to it. Another really big reason is the bit rates, because newer codecs generally have a better quality per, per bit. And since internet connections have a certain maximum speed, it's really important to make sure that uh, you can send the best quality possible in the least amount of data. So that's a really good reason to pick a particular codec. Hardware support is another big one, because uh, since encoding and decoding, especially video, is a really processor-intensive uh, operation, you will probably want to have some kind of hardware acceleration for it. And this is a reason that, for example, if something is H.265 uh, and it's really high def and you're watching this on your cell phone, your cell phone practically melts in your hands because it has no hardware support. So that's a big reason to pick a codec. And uh, finally, container and transport compatibility, which is really convenient in a way. Uh, because some containers of transport simply can only handle a certain set of codecs. And then, well, you're kind of stuck with picking that particular one. Which brings us to containers. 
Uh, containers, they dictate how you can mix these codecs together into a single stream or file. And some of the popular choices are MPEG-TS, which is often used for traditional broadcast, uh, but also ISO MP4. I think everyone is probably familiar with MP4 files. And MKV, uh, also known as, well, it's not exactly the same thing as WebM. Uh, WebCam is a subset of MKV, actually. It's, called, it's pronounced Matroshka, uh, which is a codec that uh, enthusiasts of um, things like uh, Japanese series and such often use because it has excellent subtitle support. And it can basically contain anything. But MP4 is a more straightforward choice, and TS the more traditional choice. And there's others, of course, but these are the more popular ones. And then there's uh, Flash, which I consider a codec, even though it's not, uh, sorry, a uh, container, even though it's not technically a container, because RTMP and FLV, which are the flash, flash formats, basically have the same limitations from each other, and they limit what you can pick as well. And I'm considering RTP uh, a container as well, even though it's te technically a transport method, because it's common among different, trans different transport methods as well. So going into transport methods, uh, these say how those codecs inside their container are transported over the internet. And this is the main thing that has an impact on what the quality of your delivery will be. And I've split this into three different types of delivery. You have the true streaming protocols, which are RTSP, RTMP, WebRTC. And what these do is they do what, what I consider actual streaming. As in, um, you connect to them over usually a something proprietary, because all of these are protocols that are not by default integrated into uh, players or devices yet. WebRTC should be in the future. And as a, uh, as a pro for these, they have really fast start times, really low latencies. So they're great for life. However, they need a media server or web server extension to work. And they usually, though not always, have trouble breaking through firewalls, making it cumbersome to deliver them. So technically, the best choice for life. But there's a lot of buts in there. And then as uh, a second type, we have pseudo streaming. And pseudo streaming is when you take a media file and you bit for bit deliver it, uh, not all at once, but you stream it to the end delivery point. And doing so uh, gives you the advantages of having low latency and also very high compatibility because it can pretend to be a file download. Uh, but on the other side, you still need some kind of media server or web server extension to deliver this format. It's slightly easier, though, and there's no firewall problem, so that's nice. And the finally, we have segmented HTTP, which is the current dominant way to deliver media. And you'll see all the, the current buzzwords of HLS, Dash, and Fragmented Net before, and all those are in there. What these bas basically are, they're a folder of different segments of video files. And uh, each of these segments contains a small section of the file, uh, say 10 seconds at a, t at a time or something like that. Now, this has a lot of nice advantages. It's extremely easy to proxy, because you can use a normal web proxy server, which are extremely easy to find and set up. Uh, you can use regular web servers for delivery, so no need for a media server or anything like that. But they have the really big disadvantage of having a slow startup time and really high latency. For example, HLS in practice is between 20 and 40 seconds of delay, which is unacceptable for some types. And all of these kind of have the same type of delay, usually. Some of them can go slightly faster, but you will never get sub-second with these. So that's kind of the transport methods that we can choose from. That was my brief introduction, so I'd say it's on to the next panelist.